surprised. Uh, yeah, I'd like to introduce Professor Snowden. Um, I've known him for sure, almost 12 years. We used to work together in, in IBM. And uh, yeah, the first time I, I came across his thinking and the, the framework, it just kind of shifted my horizons and I believe that is what will happen for you guys today as well. So um, he's affiliated to several universities. He's the um, CEO of a company called Cognitive Edge out of Singapore. But um, I think without saying too much more, I want to hand over to you. Okay. Um, just by way of rules of engagement, if anybody wants to ask a question, feel free to do so. If anybody wants an argument about something, that would be really welcome. All right? <laughs> just come from a week in Singapore where never, and never, and nobody ever, ever argues with you under any circumstances whatsoever. <laughs> Um, and also, I should actually thank you, because I haven't been to South Africa and to, for about four or five years. Um, came back recently. You know, I was first year in the 70s, but that was programmed to combat racism, but that's going way back, all right? Um, the contrast, given the engineering work that you guys have done on arrival experience, if you don't realize it from an international perspective, is wonderful. It's kind of like it used to be. It felt like landing in Latin America. You needed a password <coughs> for your taxi driver. You weren't sure what the hell you were doing. Now it just feels like another international airport and if I can you know I, that, I think that's a compliment it's intended as such it's just routine you come off you get on a train you get to somewhere right so I'm hugely impressed by that um, as we go through however the danger is when you're successful at something the next thing actually often goes badly wrong yeah because the pattern of past success breeds the complacency which leads to future failure so part of our job at the moment is kind of like to pick up off on that quote, which actually isn't from Mark Twain. I, I've been corrected on this, but it's too good not to say it was from Mark Twain. He would have said it if only he thought of it, I think. Right? Basically, it's the things you're really good at where actually things go disastrously wrong. Right? So part of what we're going to be doing in the next two days is giving you methods, tools, and concepts um, to increase what's called anticipatory awareness. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, all the work we've done, and this really originates with counter-terrorism work before and after 9-11, says actually you can't really anticipate the future. The issue is how do you trigger human beings to a heightened state of awareness when something bad or something good is more plausible, i.e. it might happen. Right? And that actually involves a whole variety of things we'll teach you over the next two days, uh, one of which is the concept of what's called human sensor networks, because human beings spot things that computers can't. Yeah. Um, if you actually go back again, counterintelligence, probably the most successful counterintelligence hit group in the history of the world was the East German secret police, the Stasi. Um, having spent two nights in one of their cells naked one January in the 70s, I will remember them fondly. All right. um, they had one informer for every 64 members of the population. Yeah. Now, nothing escapes a sensor network of that type. What we're going to be looking at is methods and tools that allow you to use your workforce as a sensor network yeah, and actually to use citizens as sensor networks. And this is sometimes known as beyond big data. If you've heard the hype about big data, well, to give another example from a project we're doing in Singapore, I can tell you, you know, through the octopus cards, no, sorry, that's Hong Kong, yeah, you get confused from time to time, through the MRT cards, where people got on a train and where they got off. Yeah? But I can't tell you why they made the journey. So starting to understand the why requires human intelligence, not just machine intelligence. And so we're going to do that emphasis. 
So in order to do this, I'm going to introduce some key concepts. The work I started in IBM 20 years ago and left IBM 10 years ago to continue um, is to take a natural science approach to social systems. Yeah, I, I think social science has got in a really bad place. And kind of like we now know far more about systems and we know far more about the human brain over the last 20 years than we've ever known in the history of humanity before. So our job is to bring that bring that, that message and that learning across. Yeah? Um, as we go through this, I'll talk about other projects. Okay. So I say, the idea is we'll give you some of that base science and some of the foundation for it as we go through. We're going to draw on what's called complex adaptive systems theory. Anybody come across that? Okay. Also known as the science of uncertainty. Um, it's a science of systems where you can't know what's going to happen in the future because and things will only repeat by accident not by design. But that doesn't mean that we can't design interventions. You understand a complex adaptive system by interacting with it. So some of the work we'll do this afternoon or tomorrow morning is to design what are called safe to fail interventions. You know, faced with a complex problem, you don't try and analyze it, you don't try and interpret it because you'll just apply a past approach. You run multiple parallel safe to fail experiments very quickly, engage in large numbers of people. Right, so we're going to do some design on that. Some of those may be suitable for your projects. Yeah, the, the sort of stuff Benny and um, uh, sorry, Berlin talked about earlier. Right? So we'll move on to that. The other thing is cognitive neuroscience. We know far more about the way the human brain makes a decision. We actually know that the human brain never makes a rational decision based on a careful evaluation of all <coughs> available choices, or at least the only people who do that are autistic. Yeah? And you know, the trouble is we design systems for autism these days, and that can be quite dangerous. Um, we also know from anthropology that narrative is more important than documents. So, for example, I've done a lot of work with engineers, with people like Len Lees. The primary knowledge transfer mechanism is stories told on the job, not documents written when they get back to the office. Yeah. We also know, for example, that the way people know things in the field is different from the way they describe things when they're interviewed back in the office a day later. Yeah, and we'll go through a lot of this stuff as we go through. And what I'm going to try and give you is actually any engineer knows this stuff already. It's called common sense. The trouble is we haven't had a science of common sense for a long time. So it's about time we introduced it. All right? um, I should also say that my reputation um, is as professional curmudgeon. All right? And I rather like this cartoon. I'm thinking of having made it as a badge. All right? So at times I'm going to make slightly extreme statements. I'm going to do it quite deliberately because I want to shift you from understanding on some areas. So in order... If you say something which is halfway familiar, people will associate it with a previous pattern. So sometimes I'm going to make much stronger distinctions than I really mean. So I reserve the right to be more reasonable under questioning, right? Um, but I'm going to make the distinctions to make the point up front right? as we'll go through. So I say, feel free to challenge us as we go through. We're also going to take you through a series of exercises. The first one is an exercise called Future Backwards. We'll do that in about half an hour. All of the techniques I'm going to use are ones that you can take and use. So we can actually give you the templates, the worksheets. So I'm going to try and give you things you can take back and use with your own staff in the office as well. Right? So don't assume you need experts to do it. OK, so the key context on this, I'm going to start off with statistics. It's a switch from thinking about robustness to resilience. And this is a major strategic shift happening worldwide at the moment. Um, partly because of increased population pressure, global warming. You all know the pressures, and you've had them in South Africa for longer than we've had them in other parts of the world. Yeah, fundamentally, the idea you can survive unchanged is probably an error. So robustness is surviving unchanged to design. Resilience is surviving changed. Uh, you come through something, and you're different at the end of it, but you still have coherence or continuity of identity. Um, now... So let's look at it in the context of risk. And I'm going to start off with some statistics. OK, so we're all familiar with this particular curve, a bell curve, a Gaussian distribution, a normal distribution. And most of the ways in which risk is assessed is the assumption is if you cover off all the things that fall within a certain amount of standard deviations of the mean, you've done everything that can be reasonably expected of you. It's interesting, search algorithms on the internet also work off these. And most social science research eliminates outliers. The idea is mean is in the center of the curve. And anything which falls outside of that is called a low probability but potentially high impact event. And the argument is you can't be expected to reasonably cover this because it's so unlikely it's not going to happen. Or if it does happen, 
you can't be reasonably expected to handle it. Right? That's, that's, and that's the phrase which is used. The trouble is that Gaussian distributions don't often appear in nature. Um, they appear for things like human height. But in the majority of cases, if I do a double log scale of size against frequency, um, I get what's called a power law or a Pareto distribution. So this is earthquakes. Yeah, so there are a lot of small earthquakes, a small number of large earthquakes. There are a lot of small floods, a small number of large floods. There are a lot of small software errors, yeah, a small number of large software errors. And the same is true of you know, engineering errors, you know, tolerance levels on beams. Yeah, virtually everything you look at which has a human or a natural element into it, if you do a double log scale, you get this curve. Um, and it's a, it doesn't follow the straight line at the top. There are reasons for that we'll come back into a minute. Now, if I overlay a Pareto curve on a Gaussian one, I get that. So my so-called low probability event is now actually a medium probability event. And when we first presented this at the Academy of Management, I called this the New Orleans Levies problem. People assessed the risk that the New Orleans Levies would fail on the assumption that flooding follows a Gaussian distribution, where actually flooding follows a Pareto distribution. So the so-called highly improbable event was far more probable than they thought. Yeah. Now, this is a very important because under these conditions, with the amount of events or things that you might have to cover off, you can't possibly prevent all of those happening. It just becomes too expensive. And we see this with counter-terrorism I and mean, the nonsense of airport security. Yeah, because you're far more likely to get killed walking out of the road here than you are by any terrorist incident. But because of the PR impact of terrorism, we spend a vast fortune of, of government resources on trying to prevent extremely unlikely events. Yeah? And actually, we, I, I would argue, and others are arguing, we'll make ourselves more vulnerable because we're making human beings less attentive. Yeah, if you don't know it, some of the experiments on this, when in a Dutch city, they removed all road markings and all, all traffic lights, and they radically reduced accidents. Because what happened is people had to pay more attention, yeah, and therefore they worked things out. Whereas actually, if people would drive into the traffic lights, sorry, the robots, they didn't think about it, they just followed the lights and went through patterns. So actually getting human beings to pay attention is really important. And actually, if we don't have too many props and too many supports, we do that in a different way. Another example on this, some of the modern work on health and safety. And I'm going to throw a lot of examples I'll come back to later, but I'm trying to tune into the ideas. So these days, if you look at the work we've done on mining safety in South Africa and elsewhere, the reality is if people don't break the rules, the job doesn't get done. And this is the harsh reality of my experience of most civil engineering. Yeah, we're doing work with Boeing at the moment on safety. And in order to get planes out, sometimes people have to break the rules. Yeah? The trouble is that and people have made the rules tighter and harder and more and more exceptions, so people can't remember the rules. I mean, the average rule book these days is something you can't possibly deal with. It's just got too many things in it. Yeah? So the modern approach is very different. What we have is fewer rules, which are easier to remember and harder enforced, but we have a rule about when you're allowed to break the rules. And then we have heuristics which operate on the other side of that boundary. So the principle is, and this is human cognition, if you know you're breaking the rules, you will pay attention in a different way. So for example, the US Marines, where Klein and I did work, if the battlefield break plan breaks down, you operate off three heuristics, capture the high ground, <coughs> stay in touch, keep moving. So everybody is trained in that. If you don't know what the hell to do, capture the high ground, stay in touch, keep moving. That's an easy to operate principle. Yeah. Give a personal example of this. Um, many years ago when my daughter was this high, you, know, you remember when daughters are in that charming phase of eight or nine years old before hell sets in for the next 15 years, all right? So we're still in that charming phase. She's now 25 and I can have civilized conversations with her again, all right? But there was this period. <laughs> so we're on the top of a well on Conway Castle in Wales and she drops her toy rabbit off the side of a, of a tower and it drops down 30 meters and lands on a ledge. Right? Now this is the rabbit without which we cannot go to sleep at night. You know those rabbits? <laughs> now this is, as far as I'm concerned, an extreme event which justifies any amount of rule breaking. All right? The thought of having daughters not able to sleep and me having to pick up the consequences does it. And my hobby then, and I'm trying to get back to it at the moment, actually was climbing. So from a rock climbing point of view, a castle wall is nothing. It's vertical, it's got handholds. So it's quite easy. So I go over the wall, climb down, pick up the rabbit, climb back up, hand over rabbit. Yeah. And it was worth the hour and a half I spent in Conway Police Station explaining myself you know, for the day Daddy Saved Lisa story, yeah. um, which is still around today. I quite like that story. Yeah. 
But either way, when I went over the wall, I knew I didn't have the right footwear, I didn't have protection, so I was probably never, ever safer because I'm actually now repeating to myself the rules you get taught when you first learn to climb, three points of contact, three points of contact, three points of contact. Don't move one limb until the other three are secure. Now, when you climb as a hobby, sometimes you're hanging by two fingers if you're lucky, right? But the reality is I now know I'm breaking the rules, I'm doing things I'm safe, so I'm falling back to heuristics. Um, the other thing, we'll come on to this tomorrow as well, which we're doing for Boeing, is to measure attitudes to safety. Because actually attitudes are a lead indicator, whereas compliance is a lag indicator. And as a senior executive, you need lead indicators so you can act, rather than lag indicators so you can recover. Because the whole of this space is about doing something radically different. It's about early detection, fast recovery, and speedy exploitation of the opportunities provided. This is actually the entrepreneurial field. Entrepreneurs are brilliant at seeing the pattern early and actually exploiting it before anybody realizes it's coming through. So again, this is this anticipatory awareness concept. What you're trying to do here is get to the point, sorry, over here, yeah, you're trying to get to the point where you see things before other people see them, yeah, and you can act accordingly. Yeah, and a lot of the methods and techniques we're going to teach are all about dealing with that. Yeah. Now, if we move on and we look at the actual Pareto distribution here, I've extended that. Um, over here, remember it didn't follow? That, that's, that follows a Gaussian distribution, not a Pareto. The reason is that's a space where many things have happened in the past which will repeat in the same way in the future. So if that's the case, I can confidently assess probabilities. Any failure to forecast the future is a failure of analysis or a failure of data capture. And really in a modern day and age, there's no excuse for not doing this properly. Yeah, you, all, you can all come up with many examples of this without a problem. Fundamentally, this is a good space. If we can be in this space, we've got a level of certainty. We've got a level of structure. It's where we apply things like rigid process management, rigid controls. Yeah, and we apply rule-based behavior because we've got a system where we can predict the future. The trouble is, as I move over here, the number of things which have happened in the past which will repeat in the future is going down. And the number of possible things that could happen in the future is going up. So I'm not getting a many-to-many -many relationship anymore. And now I've got to deal with anything which is possible. And the set of things which are possible is much bigger than the set of things which are probable. And this is where traditionally people do things like scenario planning. Have you guys done scenario planning yet? OK, well, I don't know how you did it, but the normal process is a group of senior executives go off-site with some extremely expensive consultants for a week and end up producing a two-by-two two matrix. Anything involving consultants always ends up with a two-by-two two matrix. Yeah. Yeah. If you didn't know it, there's an international conspiracy. When you come to a business school to do a full-time master's degree, you're given a drink, and that drink is vi virus has been implanted, <laughs> which produces a compulsive desire to reduce all problems to two-by-two two matrices. And if you join one of the large consultancy firms, it's topped up in the coffee machines every day. Right? <laughs> Either way, so scenario planning, you do a forces and factors analysis, you produce a two-by-two two matrix, you produce narrative for the four corners in the center, and there are variations on this, but that's the way it works. And now you scope what's called the cone of, cone of possibilities. Now, this is actually quite cute if you're in this space. It's very valuable. The trouble is, if you're dealing with a higher level of uncertainty, you've now reduced your, you've increased your risk because you think you've covered the future, and things which come left field will give you even more shock. Now, there's almost an argument under conditions of extreme uncertainty not to do scenario planning because it gives you a false sense of confidence. Yeah, but again, it's a valuable technique here. And that in management theory is where a lot of what's called systems thinking generally sits. Yeah? Um, it deals with a level of uncertainty, but it still assumes a causal relationship. It still assumes a structure. It still assumes you can deal with things rationally. Yeah? The trouble is, as I move further to the right, sorry, and that's also the space where I deal with hypothesis-based or inductive techniques. Now, you're all probably familiar with this. It's called case-based approaches. So if you read any article in the Harvard Business Review, with the exception of one rather good one in November of seven, but I wrote that, right? Um, <laughs> they actually do things. They study 10 or 15 companies. And they say, these companies all have this desirable quality. All do these things. So if you do these things, you too will be successful. Everybody familiar with that approach? Uh, this in real science is caused the confusion of correlation with causation. The fact you have a correlation doesn't mean you've got a causal factor. So, for example, if you study 30 companies and all their CEOs have regular bowel movements, 
it doesn't follow that recruiting on the basis of toilet habits will be similarly successful. Yeah, you've confused correlation with causation. I mean, regular bowel movements are associated with lack of stress, so there may be some linkage between the two, but you haven't got a causal linkage. And the explanation may actually be much, be made much simpler. If you take one of the classics on this called Good to Great, if anybody's read that one, uh, which is a brilliantly constructed book. It does a huge amount of research on a group of companies who are said to have survived for a long period of time. So they're survivors. And, you know, it does the correlation stuff. It does the causation stuff. It's a Harvard professor. I mean, Harvard professors are trained in marketing. So we have things like the hedgehog principle, yeah, in a best-selling book, yeah? It's all cute, but if you look at it as an evolutionary biologist, you say, hang on a minute, he's selected the dominant predators. Right? Now, dominant predator theory in biology says the first predator into an ecological niche stabilizes the ecology, and the rest of the ecology organizes around the predator. Mm -hmm. And the predator survives no matter how incompetent they are until the ecology itself is destroyed. And if you actually look at the companies he chose, like IBM, they were the dominant predator in their field, but when the ecology shifts, all of a sudden they can't survive because actually you've got a different factor behind it. Now, I don't say you can't learn from studies of what other people have done, but you've got to be very, very careful about the way you do it. Because as I move further to the right, these techniques break down. Up until this point, I can use what other people have done as really valuable learning, and I should do that. As I move further over to here, life gets very different. You know, so if we look at the issues around the new airport-based city, there aren't many examples in the world where that's been done, and very few examples where it's been done in an economy and a culture like South Africa. So you're now shifting to a true Pareto world where you have to deal with anything which is plausible. Here, yeah, the number of things which have happened in the past which will repeat in the future is very, very limited. In fact, it may be what Jim March famously called the problems of samples of one or less. Yeah? But the number of plausible things which could happen is it almost infinite. Yeah, so I've got a very few to very many relationship, and that's a very different field. And that's where our techniques become non-hypothesis based, because if you've got a hypothesis, it filters what you see. Yeah, it also, in this space, by the way, increases conflict, and we're going to talk about strategic conflict this afternoon. How do you radically reduce conflict? And one of the reasons you get conflict in this space, which is where most strategy takes place, is the data will support competing hypotheses. So trying to resolve that conflict with traditional methods actually won't work because it's actually impossible to do so. At the stage at point where you're here, the data supports competing hypotheses, so we need a different approach. Yeah? That's also where we move into what's called abductive logic, so deductive, if A, then B. Inductive, all the cases of A have B associated with them, so I can impute some linkage between it. Abduction, the great contribution of American philosophy to logic, is sometimes called the logic of hunches. So it's what's the most plausible connection between two apparently unconnected things. Yeah. Now we're going to come on to this a lot because this is what innovation is about. So for example, when an engineer maintaining a magneto on a radar machine in 1947 notices that a chocolate bar melts in their pocket, he makes an abductive leap and we get microwave ovens. Yeah. If I look at all the work I did with Land Lease on the big buildings around um, Blue Water in Kent and the like, their genius <coughs> of in invention is actually abductive, is making a connection between a technology developed for one function and something completely different. Yeah? And that requires a very different process. Yeah, it's where you get different types of innovation. It's seeing connections and when you're trying to get cultural change yeah, at the same time, because you're not going to be able to manage a different type of transport infrastructure here without associated cultural change, you're talking about what's called a co-evolutionary process. And again, I'm going to come back to some of these words in more detail later. You need culture to co-evolve with technology. You can't design one or the other. They have to evolve. And that gives you a more sustainable and more resilient position. So again, what we're now doing there is moving from what's called anticipation to anticipatory awareness. Now, I want to illustrate this with a project we're doing at the moment because this is nothing whatsoever to do with engineering. You'll find I'm going to do a lot with that. I'm going to try and pick examples from non-engineering environments because I want you to make the link across. Right? If I pick examples from engineering, you're going to start to argue with the engineering example rather than thinking about what it means. All right? So that's just the nature of humanity. It also makes it a lot safer for a generalist like me to come up with good examples. Right? 
So one of the things we're doing at the moment is with social workers. So if you know the problem with social work in the UK at the moment is if they take a child into care because they think they're at risk of abuse, then the press punish them for tearing children away from their families. Yeah, and you get sob stories and everything like that. On the other hand, if a child is abused, then they get punished for not taking the child into care. So they are, to use that old British phrase, on a hiding to nothing. Whatever they do is wrong. And the trouble is, child abuse, thank God, is a good example of a Pareto distribution. You get lots of very small minor abuse, you get very few cases of significant abuse. So what we're doing there is we're transferring social workers across the field records, and we're talking, Benny and I had a conversation about this yesterday, we may set this up, is to give you a chance to keep narrative-based learning as you go through this course. Yeah, because what we're doing is we're transferring the social workers over to rather than write a report at the end of the day, to actually keep field notes as they go around, which are self-interpreted at the point of origin. I'll talk a bit about this tomorrow. Yeah, but the principle is you've got quant data coming in as well as qual. Yeah, sorry, my background is physics and philosophy. Uh, that gives me a philosopher's delighted argument and a physicist's contempt for social science. All right? And you'll see that come through. Yeah, I just don't buy it. All right? So yeah, quant data I can trust. Qual data I'm very dubious about. Yeah, so the issue, you know, one of the things we've been doing for the last 10 years is how can we create quant in traditionally a qual area? Because then I can do something with numbers. Yeah? It's difficult. So basically what's happened is social workers are capturing records. They can also interview the kids. They can interview the parents. The parents, the kids, or the social workers self-interpret the story at the time into a quantitative framework. So I've got real-time sensors. Uh, we did the same thing with the US Army in Afghanistan. So basically, in return for not having to write a patrol report, company commanders readily volunteered to keep field notes as they were going around on a patrol. Because uh, just a question, yeah. because uh, you mentioned our social worker for that standard, that they should keep records. Same with medical doctors. Yeah, but the point is they keep notes at the end of the day. They keep loose notes as they go around, and they're forced to write them up, and they finally do it three or four days later. Okay. So what you've done is you've got reflective knowledge at the end of it. And the same happens on engineering reports and fault reports yes. and near-miss reports. Yes. They're written up too long after the event itself. So they're actually done to represent the political reality at the time. Not intentionally, well, sometimes intentionally. We want field records at the time because we know they're different. Right? Mm -hmm. So I now got, that allows me to look at patterns over multiple social workers in real time. Mm -hmm. yeah, just like on the, Amer the American Army, I can now look at field reports in real time and overlay the human metadata on the data coming in from actual sensors, which gives me a human interpretive layer on top. We're doing this on ID detection, same sort of principle. Yeah? What then happens is once a child is abused, or with historical cases of child abuse, I then go to these field observations, which were indexed when people didn't know it was an adverse outcome. I then get them re-indexed with the benefit of hindsight, and of course they'll be indexed differently. It's then a simple bit of Boolean mathematics to create a learning algorithm which the next time a social worker interviews somebody in the field, it will go past the threshold level, which will trigger a symbol on their iPhone, which basically says, stay in this house and ask some more questions. Now, you see the difference between anticipation and anticipatory awareness? You're saying, I can't anticipate this because actually I'm dealing with a, 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 a Pareto universe where plausibility is high, and I'm only going to get it right maybe one in 50 times. But what I'm doing is I'm trigger human beings to pay more attention to a problem. Yeah. Now, again, that's a key switch. Yeah. It's saying as I move further into higher levels of uncertainty, early detection is key. Yeah. Because the sooner I spot something, the lower the cost of dampening and the lower the cost of amplifying. Because actually the real opportunities for innovation and change come through weak signals, not strong <coughs> signals. Yeah. If you can actually pick up a weak signal and amplify it quickly, yeah, and actually before the press do it, because the press will always amplify it negatively, I mean, you guys are a success, so the press will want you to be a failure. I mean, that's just the way the press works. Yeah? They're, they're, they'll build stories about how you're successful for a period, but then, boy, will they jump on the chance for it to be a failure, then they'll magnify it very quickly. Yeah? So the issue is, how do you spot those things and amplify them yourselves, and also, how do you feed the press? Yeah, a lot of this stuff is, how do you feed press stuff that they can handle, so that they become part of the evolving ecology, and I'm using the word ecology deliberately, which surrounds engineering projects. Because these days, you're not just architecting the engineering, you're architecting the social systems which will use it. Yeah, and that requires a different body of skills and a different body of techniques. So, so I'm trying to set the techniques here. I'm not going to teach you much over here. 
Other people will do that, and you can read it up. We're going to focus on this stuff. Because to be quite honest, that's where leaders should be focusing their time and attention, and that's where strategic threat and strategic opportunity exist. Yeah? Yeah, Jack. Uh, we're going to be doing that this afternoon. Yeah. Because you can do a lot of work there, but you actually Yeah. And that would be equally stupid. Yeah. I mean, that's a disagreement I have a lot with other complexity thinkers. They actually think everything is over on the right. Mm -hmm. I'm actually saying, no, there's a whole bunch of stuff on the left. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in operating systems these days, operating theatres, mm -hmm. we've kind of like worked out it's quite a good idea to count the number of operating instruments left at, after the operation mm -hmm. and check that they're the same at the start. And you do not want to know how many forceps were left in bodies before this process was instituted in American hospitals. It's a really scary percentage. Now, that's actually dealing on the left. I can make that highly ordered and structured. And I don't want that left to random chance or self-organization or heuristics. So rules work really well where I can predict the future. Heuristics work really well where I can't. Yeah, and it's, th this is different things work in different domains. But we're going to focus on that heavily yeah, this afternoon. Right, I want to introduce one other concept, then we're going to go through a couple of exercises. Right? Traditionally, people present an option, you've either got something which is chaotic or you've got something which is ordered. Uh, more governments have sustained tyrannies on the basis of saying these are the only two options that I can think of, and the same is true of tyrannical authorities and companies. Right? The idea is we've either got chaos or we've got order. Now, the reality is actually there are three types of systems which, which exist in nature. Ordered systems, chaotic systems, and complex systems. Yeah? And complex systems are actually the most interesting because they're the most frequent. And the key thing, I'll put a phrase up now, but then I'm going to go and define my terms. You absorb complexity. You don't delude, your, delude yourself to thinking you can eliminate it. Yeah, a big mistake people are trying to make is to reduce complexity to something everybody can understand. Well, then you've stripped so many things away that weak signals will surprise you. Right? So a lot of leadership is about the ability to absorb levels of uncertainty, to ride the flow, to manage the patterns. And we're going to talk a lot about pattern-based intelligence later on. So that allows me to define three types of system. And to get this right, I need to define two types of language. Um, I'm going to define a system as any network with coherence. Now, coherence is a really important word. It underpins the new approaches to evidence-based policy. Because I can't know that something is going to be the right thing to do, but I can know that some routes are more coherent than others. Yeah, so to use the example I love using in the southern United States, I can say that evolutionary theory is coherent to the facts, even though we know it's not completely right, whereas creationism is incoherent to the facts, because the level of the type of hypothesis you have to construct to make it work is just crazy. And that developed a specialist line in the states of arguing against creationists from the Bible there are advantages to having a Jesuit once in your life, all right? And it's quite fun arguing from the Bible. But the point is, some, st some hypotheses are incoherent. They're not worth investigating. Some are coherent. And we'll talk about how you measure for coherence later. Yeah? Um, the other metaphor I often use for coherence is think about a spider's web early in the morning. Yeah, you can see it's coherent, but it's not completely structured. It's half formed. And most human systems are coherent like the spider's web is coherent. You can see a pattern, but it's not perfect. Which is why, for example, reducing organizational charts to rigid hierarchies, that tells you how it is. One of the techniques we'll talk about decision information mapping is to actually show what actually is going on, not how people think it should be. And you actually see, for example, decision maps tend to be messy, whereas actually process maps tend to be highly structured and ordered. Now, which doesn't mean they're wrong, but they work in different ways. So hold the spider's web, right? So a system is a network with coherence. It's more organic, it's mechanical. And an agent is anything which acts within the system. Now, it's important to realize in human systems, individuals are less important than stories. Yeah? Anthropologists now use the phrase homo narrans as much as they do homo sapiens. We're storytelling apes. And stories determine culture. Now, it's quite interesting when people join organizations, within three to four months, their personal stories have now started to match the dominant stories of the organization itself because story is an identity structure. And they determine political differences. To give my own personal example, um, I went to university in Britain in the 1970s. If you went to university in Britain in the 1970s, the issue wasn't whether you were on the left or right politically, but what type of Marxist were you and had you occupied the university yet this year? I mean, that was the way it worked, right? I was leader of the Catholic Marxist-Leninist group. I'm 
nobody stood a chance against us. We had political and religious discipline. We controlled campus for three years. You know, that was the way it worked. In my final year, we occupied the university for six weeks. They dragged us out with the police. They set up a special tribunal. 25 of us were expelled from the university. Uh, we all went on to work for IBM and joined MI5 and MI6. But never mind, this was the 70s. Right? Um, we were expelled from the university. We appealed to Her Majesty the Queen, and we were reinstated by a, a ruling of the Privy Council. I learned a huge amount in 1975 about jurisprudence, but I learned it in the courtrooms, not in the classroom. Yeah? And we set the university up for that. It took a year of plotting to set them up for it, and they fell for it big time. Now, on the basis of that, and going backwards and forwards across the war in East Berlin in the later 70s, which is also when I first came to South Africa, I can distinguish between 15 types of Marxists based on a five-minute conversation in a bar late at night, because a not an amount of my time in my 20s was spent doing precisely that. Yeah? I now work in Washington for people, if you told me I was going to work for them in the 70s, I'd have had myself taken out and shot for the sake of the revolution. They think Tony Blair of fond memory is a socialist, which anybody from Europe can't understand, mm -hmm. yeah, and they can distinguish between 15 different varieties of the neoconservative religious right, which to me is an amorphous mass, which justifies the full imposition of the Inquisition with all of its tools and instruments. Right? Now, there's no genetic difference between us. The difference is the entrained patterns of the stories of the societies in which we grew up. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. And actually, South Africa has a story, and the story has changed significantly in different periods of time. Your organization <coughs> has a story. Yeah, narratives have far more influence on people than people's choices. Yeah, which is why the whole new approach to market research and employee understanding is to map the narratives. Because the narratives have agency, that's the point I'm trying to make. Don't assume it's a person making a choice, it may actually be a narrative. Yeah, if anybody's read Terry Pratchett's science fiction books? <laughs> yeah, he has this concept that stories are an evil virus, all right, that want to be told and they won't let human beings not tell them. So in The Witches Abroad, which is one of the best ones, volume three, yeah, the princess wants to not marry the prince. But the story will not let her not marry the prince because that's what the story wants. Yeah? Now, actually, you can see a lot of this if you look at the sort of post-apartheid period in South Africa. There's a story the world wants to hear, so the world hears that story. Yeah? And there's a story that people want to hear about. This works at different levels, right? It works at organizational subgroup level. Yeah? So I'm just trying to emphasize that. Don't think of this as you know, people are agents and they've got a network. Human systems are much more complex. Yeah, and understanding and mapping that is actually key. That allows me to define three types of system. An ordered system is one where the level of constraint is such that agent behavior is predictable. And that's actually where we want things to be. Because if we can predict all behavior, kind of like we can engineer it, we can manage it, that's good news. Yeah? So don't think this is wrong. It's, it's actually extremely useful. Remember my hospital example? The trouble is, if you've over-constrained a system which isn't naturally constrainable, you build up tension in the system, so when the system fails, it fails catastrophically. So we did a whole program in IBM which identified that the level of perceived bureaucracy is directly proportional to the density of informal networks. So what actually happens is the company becomes more bureaucratic, your networks build to work around the bureaucracy. Because people are well intentioned, they try and make things work. And don't talk about procurement rules, because these are a classic example of actually inducing fraud because they're over constrained. Yeah? Um, so people start to play the game, they play the rules yeah? in terms of the way things work. And there's an old adage in the software industry if you didn't write the RFI, why are you tendering? Yeah? Because that's the way the game goes. Right? So people are playing games. So the problem is that because people are making the system work despite itself, pressure builds up in the system. Yeah, and actually the system, although it appears to be efficient at surface level, is becoming more and more inefficient underneath. So when it finally breaks, it breaks catastrophically, normally with a scandal or something like that. So again, we'll talk about this later, but monitoring for excessive bureaucracy is a key leadership characteristic, because that's where the really nasty shocks are going to come in from, because it looks neat and tidy. So again, the argument is there's nothing wrong with this stuff, provided you realize the boundaries. Yeah? So basically here, we've got a high level of constraint. We then move on to chaotic systems. In a chaotic system, the agents are unconstrained. Now, this is a very rare phenomenon. It's very difficult for something to be completely random because patterns form very quickly. Um, but basically, if you can maintain it, I mean, if you fall into chaos accidentally, it's a catastrophe and you hardly ever survive. On the other hand, if you enter it deliberately within a contained space, you get radical innovation. 
if you remove all the constraints for a period of time, people will see things in a novel way. And we'll talk about innovation programs later on in the course of these two days. Right? So that's key. On the other hand, if I can actually create what's called, anybody come across a phrase called wisdom of crowds? Okay, well the two classic examples are on, on this are um, a group of farmers guessing the weight of a cow. The average of all the farmers' guesses is better than the best guess. Right? Now there are three conditions to make that work. First of all, they have to be farmers. Ideally, with 20 years' experience of working with cows, a group of McKinsey's management consultants are really not very good at guessing the weight of cows, all right? No. They can read books about it, and they can give you a $1 million report, but actually a group of farmers will get it right, okay? So you have to have tacit knowledge of the field. Yeah? And you all know, I mean, this is one of the key things about, you know, somebody with 30 years of knowledge knows what to do on a bridge, whereas somebody who's just read a book doesn't, yeah? It's, it's kind of like tacit knowledge, implicit knowledge, you understand it. Um, so that's key. The second is they mustn't know what the other farmers have guessed. Because if the first farmer writes a weight down, the other farmers will bracket the guess. Yeah, so each one has to work independently. That's why it's a chaotic system. There's no constraints. And thirdly, and there must be no major personal stake in the outcome. If people can win a lot of money from this, it will modify their behavior. Yeah. Um, the other example which I like better is an American submarine back in the 50s um, grounded off the coast of Portugal. Um, it didn't sink. I was corrected on that by an admiral at Norfolk Navy Base. He pointed out submarines are designed to sink, which is a bit humiliating, really. But you learn if somebody's got three stars on their shoulder, let them humiliate you in the first three minutes, but then it's out of their system, and they might listen to you for the rest of the lecture. Right? So if submarines go down and they can't come up again, it's called grounding. Um, they couldn't find it, so they got groups of marine experts who were only partially briefed, and that was actually important. They were only partially briefed to estimate the position. None of them got it right but the average of all of the estimates was six meters away from the submarine. Okay? Now, there are sound cognitive science and statistical reasons why that works. The project I was working on in Singapore last week is we're building a sensor network of 10,000 Singapore citizens who will be doing routine capture you know, as they travel through the MRT and stuff like that. But then if we want to ask a question of policy, we can push it out to that network and get an answer in real time. Yeah? Because we're using, and effectively, that's what I call distributed cognition or a human sensor network. And this is kind of like the new approach to whole, of, whole of workforce engagement. So chaotic systems have huge value because they give us an additional way of making more coherent decisions under conditions of extreme uncertainty because we, increase, we radically increase the number of agents in the field. Yeah? So again, the argument I'm building is all of these systems work in different ways and they have different uses. And finally, we get to a complex adaptive system. In a complex adaptive system, um, the agents and the constraints co-evolve. That means that the constraints are not full, so they can be modified by agent behavior. So both systems are modifying each other. Yeah? Now, that actually means the key concept with co-evolution is irreversibility. So as things interact with other things, patterns form from the interaction, but you can never go backwards. Uh, anybody got teenage children? or had teenage children, right, you know about co-evolution. Uh, you can't say, hang on a minute, the last four years haven't worked, I'm going to call in the management consultants, we're going to do a strategic reassessment of our child care and policy, and we'll start again with a cultural change and communication program. It doesn't work, does it? Because you're always dealing with people's perception of the present and their perception of the past. Yeah? So one of the key things is where you are is where you are. You can't be somewhere else except by a more tortuous route. Yeah? So in a complex system, co-evolution is a key concept, which means the future is inherently uncertain. The past will only repeat by accident. And one of the big dangers in this space is called retrospective coherence. When you look backwards, you can see a causal link, but actually it won't repeat. It's just it's easy with the benefit of hindsight to see how things connect. And that will give some examples on that later. Now, complex adaptive systems are really exciting because they explain why a lot of things don't work. Something which worked perfectly for one person doesn't work in what would appear to be identical circumstances. The reason is it's a complex adaptive system and the evolutionary process is different. And you can't take something. So, for example, in knowledge management, a concept called communities was taken from Boeing. So what they did is they studied what had evolved in Boeing over 20 years and they tried to replicate the end point of an evolutionary process. And, of course, it didn't work because it worked with Boeing because of that evolution over time. Right? So if you're in a complex system, 
you're always allowing novel structures to emerge, but you are still managing the constraints. And this is the key thing. You now manage constraints and you manage probes. Something we'll come to a bit later. Now, one of the best ways I've learned to explain this is to give an example. So the idea is, dependent on which of these systems you're in, you will manage in a different way. Everybody got that concept? OK, so let's take the example of a party for a bunch of nine-year-olds. Can everybody imagine running a party for a bunch of nine-year-old kids? OK, so let's actually assess the party based on which type of system it is. So if we assume the children's party is a chaotic system, it means the children's behavior will be random, which means they'll probably discover drugs and alcohol and go on a personal experience of self-discovery. Yeah, your house or property may burn down in the process, yeah, but all property is theft and it was socially constructed in the first place, so why are you worried about it? Yeah? I don't recommend this. I've got friends in California who've tried it, but never more than once. Yeah? Um, the order systems approach, on the other hand, you'd be more familiar with. Under this, it's of critical importance to agree clearly articulated learning objectives to the party in advance of the party itself. The learning objectives should be aligned with the mission statement for education and society to which you belong and should be printed off on motivational posters with pictures of eagles soaring over valleys and water dropping into ponds and placed around the wall of the room where you're going to hold the party. You then produce a project plan for the party. The project plan should have clear milestones throughout the party against which you can measure progress against ideal party outcome. And the senior adult should start the party with a motivational videotape. You don't want the children play, wasting time in play which isn't aligned with the learning objectives. And then they should use PowerPoint to demonstrate their personal commitment to the party objectives and show the children how their pocket money is linked to the achievement of the milestone targets. Following the highly successful completion of the party, you conduct the after-action review, update your best practice database on party management, and mandate future process improvements. If at this point, for any reason, the children aren't happy, you hire an appreciative inquiry practitioner who will get them to tell happy clappy stories so they have happy mental models and suitably indoctrinated, they'll like whatever you put in front of the next time. Everybody reasonably familiar with this approach to party management? <laughs> the complex systems approach on the other hand is much simpler. And excuse one swear with you, but it's necessary. We start off by drawing a line in the sand, known as a boundary in complexity theory. And we look the children in the eye and we say, cross that, you little bastards, and you die. <laughs> and one of the things you learn pretty fast as an adult is the value of flexible, negotiable boundaries because rigid boundaries have a habit of becoming brittle and breaking catastrophically. What we then introduce is catalytic probes, a football, a videotape, a barbecue, a computer game, in the hope there's a pattern of play called an attractable form. I'm deliberately introducing language now, because if you don't change people's language, you don't change the way they think. I'll expand these more later. So basically, if an attractor forms and it's beneficial, I amplify it, I give it more resource. If it's negative, I dampen it, I pull energy away from it so it stops. So what I do is I manage the emergence of beneficial coherence within boundaries, within attractors. Yeah, now that actually is a critical phrase, and I got it wrong sequence, so apologies for that. I manage the emergence of beneficial coherence within attractors, within boundaries, is that sequence. Okay. Now that allows me to manage more with significantly less. It also allows me to spend more time as a manager observing the patterns to rapidly amplify or rapidly dampen. So I'm actually able to manage in a more disciplined way and exploit evolutionary potential as it starts to emerge. Hmm? And the basic thing, if the system is complex, you only ask three questions. What can I change? Now, anything else is a waste of time. Out of the things which I can change, where can I monitor the impact of the change? Because changing things if you can't monitor the impact is a fundamental error of judgment. And out of the things which I can monitor, where are the ones, if they actually start to succeed, I can amplify them quickly, or if they start to fail, I can destroy them before they get out of hand? So actually, management now becomes both simpler and more complex at the same time. Yeah? And actually, if you want to change human systems, you manage the boundaries and the probes in emergence. Those are the three things you can manage. The boundary conditions, the probes, and the amplification or dampening of emergence, which actually means you spend a lot less money and a lot less time and you actually find spaces which you couldn't otherwise have anticipated. Now again, all of this, come back to Jack's question earlier, is actually to say most of what you do will be here. Where things go wrong is where people don't exploit this, which has huge potential, yeah, so they blind themselves, and where actually they don't realize the 5 or 10% which makes a strategic difference is down in this space. And if you try and manage that space like that, that's what the children party 
story satirizes. Uh, one more metaphor, and I'll give you a task. So imagine that this table here is a round table, and around the table there are electromagnets. Um, I'm speaking to an engineering audience, so just to be clear, the table has a very high coefficient of resistance. All right? This is a metaphor, don't take it literally. Yeah, in the middle of the table there are iron ball bearings. If all of the magnets keep the same strength and polarity, the iron ball bearings will form a stable pattern. If I change one magnet, the iron ball bearings will change in a predictable and repeatable way. In systems thinking, that is called a driver. And everybody, for the last 40 years, has been trying to find what are the drivers of human behavior. Yeah? And the assumption is there's a causal relationship. The trouble is, if it's a complex adaptive system, the next time you change this magnet, the magnet on the other side of the table will change polarity. So you'll get a completely different result. If you're really unlucky, the other magnets won't change until you've built a ha habit and you believe you've got repeatability, but then the shock will be even worse. And those magnets are called modulators. So a complex adaptive system is modulated, it's not driven. Which means actually, you understand it by intervening with it. Yeah? You experiment in it, you see what works, which doesn't work, you amplify the things which do, you dampen the things which don't. You recognize if you've only got a one-time bet, the cost of a one-time bet in a complex system is much higher than a one-time bet in an ordered system. So you're going to have to put more time and more resource in than you would if the system was ordered. Now the reality is most you know, civil engineering projects I've worked on, a lot of it is complex, a lot of it is ordered. And the errors generally come when people treat an ordered, a complex system as if it was ordered. And that's where they get the surprise. Okay? Right, so we, I want to, I'm going to do two things frequently. All right? One is stop, let you talk about something, ask questions just to consolidate the learning. The other is give you an exercise. So what I want to do now is consolidate that. So I'd like you to think about examples, either real examples or examples that could happen in the future of where you would, by accidental choice or because you were forced to by people in positions of authority, that frequently happens, to take an ordered systems approach on a complex system and what were or could be the consequences. Right? So you're treating a system which is an evolutionary complex system, remember the magnets, remember the children's party, as if it was an ordered system, which it isn't, yeah, what are the errors, what are the consequences? So examples from the past or possible examples from the future. Yeah, so I want you to talk about that on tables. Then we'll have a quick discussion. And that's also a chance if you haven't understood anything, you're confused about something, you disagree with something, then we'll answer questions. Okay, go.